Over the past few weeks, there has been a flurry of announcements regarding military aid to Ukraine. Throughout the conflict, the global community has shown a sense of unity and strength far beyond anything we really could have imagined. The scale of foreign aid to assist the Ukrainians in their fight for national survival has dwarfed any and all pre-war estimates to the point that keeping track of it all is proving a massive logistical challenge, eclipsed only by the logistical effort to actually provide the aid itself. Indeed, collective spending by the world to assist Ukraine, both public and undisclosed, has most likely passed a trillion US dollars by now. And since the signing of Lend-Lease into law, combined with the reaffirmed commitments from all of NATO's governments, the number will only increase as time goes on. As for Russia, their situation is best described as a uh, hyper-precarious. In terms of international relations, Russia has screwed up so apocalyptically badly, sanctions against them and their citizens have ravaged the economy completely, despite their claims to the contrary. The ruble is practically worthless, domestic consumption is falling rapidly, and all the massive corporations they could rely on for foreign investment and local development have chosen to leave. But before I continue, and we are currently speaking about our corporate overlords, I've got to pay the bills, so you know what time it is. It gives me great pleasure to say that this video is sponsored by Atlas VPN, and right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount. It means that you can get a 3-year subscription for just $1.99 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. But I should mention that this is a limited time offer, so you should get your deal by clicking the link in the video description below right now. But some of you may be wondering, or on the fence, why do I need a VPN? Well, let me tell you why. VPNs are the first and foremost form of protection when browsing online, and Atlas VPN has a big focus on your security. It blocks ads, malware, malicious links, and trackers, while notifying you when someone tries to steal your data. It keeps your Google searches private and untracked, ensuring you surf the net in safety, and the best part is, with just one subscription, you can protect all of your devices. Combine that with today's special offer, and you have simply the best VPN and deal on the market right now, and those savings don't stop there. By changing server locations and hunting around, Atlas gives you the ability and the opportunity to get the best deals from all over the world, and as an added bonus, this location changing feature lets you access geo-locked content on all of your favourite services like Netflix, Stan, or more importantly for me, the variety of anime streaming services. Seriously, anime licensing is painful to deal with down here in Australia, and without a VPN, my life would suck. So remember, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount and it means you can get a 3 year subscription for just $1.99 a month with a 30 day money back guarantee. But this is a limited time offer so get your deal by clicking the link in the video description below. Plus it helps out the channel and I'd appreciate it. Anyway, on to the video. Ah uh, yes, where were we? Ah, that's right, the economy. The economic damage is not limited to just the raw numbers. It is further impacted by the knock-on effects of the war, as those corporations have been followed by their best and brightest. The youth of Russia have begun an exodus en masse, leaving the country in hundreds of thousands, many of whom for the sole purpose of fleeing the draft, a draft which has been constantly expanded and updated to accommodate for the devastating losses they've suffered on the battlefield while tanking the economy still further. After all, if all your people are in the army, they aren't at home working in civilian jobs or buying stuff in civilian stores. And all of this is happening while aggravating states that border them with a refugee crisis causing yet more foreign relations disasters. In fact, if you want a good barometer about how badly they've screwed up in terms of geopolitics and diplomacy, Switzerland is no longer neutral, Finland and Sweden are joining NATO, which they've stubbornly avoided for decades, and the largest EU contributor per capita to Ukraine's defence is Luxembourg. Yes, the Principality of Luxembourg. Just for reference here, this is a screenshot of the Wikipedia page tracking aid to Ukraine. Keep in mind that Luxembourg is, as I mentioned, a principality with a tiny population and no actual defence force to speak of. They've basically sent their entire stock's worth of defence articles or purchased stuff that the Ukrainians have asked for. They've even sent them a couple of Jeep Wranglers, which, as we all know, are equivalent to a Bradley infantry fighting vehicle. Look, that's a really niche joke. If you know, you know. But, speaking of the Bradley, that is the system that has been making all the headlines recently. Armed with a 25mm Bushmaster chain gun, supported by a coaxial 7.62 M240 machine gun, and an integrated TOW-2 anti-tank missile launcher, the Bradley is an absolute monster in terms of combat power per unit. For you gamers out there, the Bradley is your socially awkward friend who only ever plays DPS. 
This weapon package is backed up by state-of-the-art situational awareness and sensor systems, including forward-looking infrared and thermal sights, high-magnification optics for both commander and gunner, blue force tracker, counter-IED technology, and a bunch of other things I don't know about, and if I did, I couldn't tell you about. This tracked vehicle is a potent force on the modern battlefield, with more confirmed main battle tank kills than anything else, I believe, and it's able to tackle just about any threat it's confronted with. It's very well armoured for a vehicle of its type too, with a full set of explosive reactive armour and smoke dispensers to improve survivability. It's also very fast cross-country, while being surprisingly agile for its weight class. This is mainly achieved by its low ground pressure and massive amount of torque. Like seriously, this thing has 1930 newton meters of torque. This thing can go 60 kilometers an hour cross-country, or for you American viewers, they can travel the length of 146,341 AR-15s every hour. Which is pretty damn quick. And it does all this to transport a squad of infantry to the objective and then stay around to support them against all kinds of threats. Hence the name, Infantry Fighting Vehicle. Overall, this thing provides a massive amount of capability to the Ukrainians, and they must be ecstatic to have it. And with the commitment of the Bradley, Germany has matched it with their own Marder IFVs, which, while not as advanced, are a marked improvement on the Ukrainians' old Soviet BMP-2s. But of course, we haven't even covered big ticket items yet. Big items like Patriot, the world's most effective missile defense system, which I have a whole video on with a subject matter expert if you're interested. Although I should specify land-based air defense system. Oh boy. This system can intercept any type of air threat fired at Ukraine from cruise missiles to drones to aircraft right up to theater ballistic missiles. It's data linked into NATO's air defenses and comes with an absolute monster of a radar. They could probably see all the way to Moscow if they put it in Kharkiv. And once they find something, they can whack any Russian airborne target with a missile the enemy can't detect. And even if they did detect it, it was going to be going far too fast for them to do anything about it. Honestly, this is one of the biggest game changers out there in terms of military aid provided. Up there with High Mars and Paladin, giving the Ukrainians a precision surface to surface in direct fire capability second to none. And it's been causing the Russians real strife in that regard. Look, I don't think I need to go into a complex breakdown of those two systems because it's artillery. It's a very simple concept, I think. I took ballistics in school! Fascinating subject! Things go up, things go down! <laughs> But of course, there is one more big announcement that came out recently, which was of course, this. The Challenger 2 main battle tank, arguably the best of its type anywhere in the world, certainly one of the most well protected, with highly classified Chobham armour, augmented by ERA, making the thing nigh on indestructible. It also comes fully equipped with smoke dispensers and seaburn protection, that's chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear, in the unlikely event that Putin crosses that threshold. It comes armed with a 120mm rifled main gun, capable of firing high explosive squash head rounds, armor piercing fin stabilized discarding sabre rounds, and regular old high explosive. It also comes with a coaxial 7.62 machine gun, along with a remote operated weapon system capable of mounting another machine gun, a 50 cal machine gun, or even a Mark 19 40mm grenade launcher. And of course, all of these are augmented with the full range of modern sensors found in NATO armoured fighting vehicles, all while being able to go practically anywhere at 30 miles an hour. It's a truly incredible feat of modern engineering, and has one of, if not the, best combat records of all of its contemporaries. But all of these fancy toys, all of the news coverage, all of the things the YouTube clickbait videos are about, which include this one, but bear with me, all of this noise about how these super weapons will finally give the Ukrainians the edge, all of it is nonsense. It's all wrong, or at least they're missing the key issue. Because while these weapons are necessary for Ukraine to continue the fight, maintain the initiative, and ultimately kick the Russians back to Moscow, there is one weapon that the world is providing Ukraine which will ultimately lead to their triumph more than anything else. A weapon so powerful it forms the cornerstone of Ukraine's national defense, yet it's so seemingly insignificant it only appears on lists given to the public as miscellaneous gear. That weapon is this. Behold, Military Article Designation MRE-24 otherwise known as a meal ready to eat. Specifically, the best one, Southwest Beef, 
although that depends on who you ask and how much you like your bathroom. This right here is how Ukraine wins. It's a tale as old as time. Armies march on their stomach is an axiom so often said. More modern variations include bullets don't fly without supply or beans, bullets, bandages in that order. But perhaps the best and most poignant phrase is borrowed from General Omar Bradley. Amateurs talk about tactics, but professionals study logistics. It's why when you see all the propaganda footage of the Wehrmacht during World War II used for the newsreels, all you see is tanks, half-tracks and artillery rolling forward onto the enemy as Stukas scream overhead. Propaganda Minister Goebbels and his cameramen wanted to show the mighty modern army of the Wehrmacht vanquishing the enemies of the fatherland. He never took the time to film the miles-long column of horse-drawn supply wagons and Opal Blitz trucks, or the endless line of steam trains. I mean, really, the only concession to logistics they did make was on the manufacturing front. Make the civilians feel important. And there, too, it was always tanks and planes with welder sparks flying and smelters boring metal. I mean, the British were a little bit better. They had the dig for victory campaign that that was more out of necessity and or panic than anything else. Point is, trucks aren't sexy, nor are cargo ships, nor are cargo trains, and unless they are putting on a show for the camera, a dining facility or defac or a field kitchen isn't sexy either. The only place MREs really shine in terms of propaganda is here on YouTube. There are a lot of MRE channels, like a serious amount, and almost all major lifestyle channels have had a go at eating MREs at least once because military food has a well-deserved reputation for being substandard. But the mainstream media, clickbait articles, and most of the other commentators don't cover it. No one's talking about the food situation. Even on the Ukraine conflict, the only person who has touched on this is of course the PowerPoint hero himself, my friend Perrin. And even then, it was rolled into one of his logistics and sustainment videos as about half a paragraph. So I thought I would cover it, because it's the one area that Ukraine has a clear advantage over the Russians, and a vital component of Western aid. Now. I know what you're thinking. Well, that's just obvious. It's taken as red. Of course people need to eat. But I don't think most people viewing actually realize just how vital the supply of MREs and other food to Ukraine is. So I'm going to do it with math and a little bit of practical example. So let's start with another question. What do you think war is? Well, if movies, social media and video games are anything to go by, it's this. However, this is all nonsense. In reality, war is this. Siv Div is currently serving in Ukraine. His content is great. I highly recommend it. Go watch his videos after you watch this one. But you will quickly see when he uploads footage of his service, for almost the entirety of the videos, nothing happens. At all. All you see is him and his comrades walking, and walking, and walking. Now walking in of itself doesn't seem so bad. It's when you add the other factors that this becomes apparent. Notice the gear they're all carrying. A combat loaded soldier in a frontline role, i.e. artillery, infantry, forward observers, forward aeromedical, etc. is going to have at least 60 pounds of gear on them at all times. Food, water, rifle, ammunition for rifle, first aid kit, body armor, helmet, and other mission critical items such as your flashlight, batteries, navigation aids, baby wipes, an extra pair of socks, survival knife, and of course your backup weapon, the MRE combat spoon. It has a confirmed kill by the way. And that's just the average. If you're on an offensive patrol, you have to take all the extra stuff you may need with you, which includes a missile launcher for anti-air or anti-armor defense, extra ammo for all those launchers, extra ammo for the machine gunner, extra 40mm grenades for the grenadier or for yourself, extra food in case you get stuck in the field without resupply, even electronic warfare equipment to take out drones or jam enemy communications. So now your combat weight is 120 pounds or more, and now you have to walk all day across this terrain. You can't walk on the road because of mines or IEDs, not to mention potential traffic as well as a complete lack of cover, so you're walking through mud, uneven grass, up hills, down hills, through rocks, around tree roots and fallen logs, various detritus, climbing through wrecked buildings. It's insane. 
just so many different obstacles in your way. And so the US Army Research Center, in a report done on combat nutrition, estimates that the soldier will burn 4,200 calories a day on average in a combat zone. But that's averaged over everyone. If it's a combat soldier on a foot patrol, which a majority of frontline actions in Ukraine are, this can go much higher. Especially in high intensity combat, like in Bakhmut, when you're running from position to position for hours at a time, clearing buildings, getting to fights, etc. These soldiers are going to require an awful lot of food to remain combat effective. But when you get into the numbers, you start to realize just how vital Western support regarding combat rations actually is. Now, there are no accurate numbers as to just how big the Ukrainian military is at the moment, nor can we really accurately estimate. But given that they have had mandatory service prior to the war and have since ordered full mobilization, we can be relatively sure that that number exceeds 1 million. But for the sake of easy math and accounting for variables like admin and logistics troops, staff officers, support units, etc., who might not have as high a calorie demand, let's go with a baseline number of 1 million Ukrainian soldiers currently in service. All right. Now, Again, I know a lot of people are going to say, not all of them are infantry, not all of them require those calories, not all of them are going to be eating MREs, not all of them have these limitations, etc, etc. But the fact is, all human beings need to eat, and every single person in uniform is a vital asset to national defense. So at the very least, the Ukrainian military needs to feed a million people every single day. How much does that cost? Well, let's see. The United States lists an MRE at $7.50 bulk cost. That is comprised of the cost of the materials to make it, the labor required to assemble it, and the shipping to get it to the front. Now under ideal conditions, you'd be eating three square meals a day. However, the realities of combat are not as forgiving. Sometimes soldiers operate on only one meal and some assorted snacks, given operational circumstances. And in the case of the infantry, they quite often have to scoff it down in the back of the truck en route to the mission area. Furthermore, given the dynamics of the aid packages to Ukraine, as well as the varying cost factors from multiple currencies across a bunch of different countries, it's hard to calculate exact values. So what we're going to do is average it out to two meals a day instead of three, spread across the entire armed forces of Ukraine. And those meals are either an MRE or a DFAC meal, priced at $7.50 a serving. So, at the calculation of $7.50 a meal, and they're eating two meals a day, Ukraine is spending... 15 million dollars us a day just to keep their army combat effective food wise though we have to assume that soldiers augment that with snacks from home stuff they bought before deployment or stuff that's commercially available however it doesn't stop there due to the ongoing campaign against ukraine's energy infrastructure blackouts are frequent meaning that refrigeration and food storage may be difficult requiring mres to be provided to civilians alongside their regular food aid as they are long life, preserved, and if needed can be heated up with a flameless ration heater. Just add water and find a rock or something to put the bag against. Because of this, many countries list their MREs under food aid. The United States does, so it's just unclear how much we've actually sent. But pictures on Telegram and on Twitter confirm that just about every type of MRE in use by the Western world is currently represented in Ukraine, not to mention Asian allies such as Japan, South Korea, and us here down under we've all sent them over as well. And given their ubiquity and the quantity required, we collectively must have sent literally millions. And we will keep sending them until victory is won. But that victory, of course, requires victory in battle. And here too, the humble MRE is where the real money is. Russian rations have a reasonable reputation among those who've tried them. Modern ones, that is. But unlike the rest of the world, Russia's economic and political isolation has made feeding of their troops a bit more difficult. As early as March, we saw Russian troops being issued with ration packs that were well past their use-by date. Now this normally isn't an issue really, but given what comprises the Russian MRE, it actually poses quite a bit of a problem. At the core, it has stale crackers, which are augmented by jam, cheese or pate depending on which MRE menu they have. Although I keep seeing the same one over and over again, so I think their menu is actually far more limited than they say. Then you have the choices of main dish, kasha, meatballs, among other things. It's not very appetizing. 
all these items aren't dried or preserved food that you can warm with a heater in a tightly sealed bag. They are all flame heated, requiring a fire or other cooking source, which can prove difficult in a combat situation. They require a designated sit-down meal time to prepare, so they have to rely on snacks for most of their time in the field. And this is, of course, as we said, assuming that you have an in-date recently made MRE to actual spec. From evidence we've seen on the front line, as well as complaints from Russian soldiers, the MREs they are getting aren't always up to that spec, and quality seems to be degrading rather rapidly. And in fact, the food situation has been rather problematic overall. One of the first things we saw during the invasion was Russian troops ransacking stores and gas stations for food. It still happens now. And we have started seeing leaked videos from the mobilization showing the atrocious conditions for the conscripts recently drafted to the front. The calorie disparity between Russian and Ukrainian troops going forward will, in my view, play a much higher role than people think. The average combat performance of the Ukrainian soldier will continue to improve, while that of Russia's deteriorates. And let's be honest, for those of us who had a rough day out before, especially you veterans, a hot meal, a bar of chocolate, or even the mythical MRE pound cake does absolute wonders for morale especially in the wet and cold of Ukraine. And looking at the quality of Russian rations I've seen, they look absolutely terrible. And reportedly, they smell even worse. And so, at the end of the day, it won't be the Bradley, it won't be the Patriot, the Challenger, the Abrams, or even the F-16, should they get it, that'll win this war. No. What will win this war is a Ukrainian with a full stomach fighting for a just and noble cause. Which is also why almost every NATO vehicle has a boiling vessel, including the Challenger and the Bradley. Because you can't fight for liberation without a good cup of tea and an MRE. And so I will leave you with a recommendation to check out and donate support to Frontline Kitchen on Twitter. He is a chef cooking fresh meals for the boys and girls at the front, and they need all the energy they can get so we can achieve victory in 2023. Slava Ukraina! See you next time.